and then share screen. Well, thank you two for coming. We have a fair amount of material to go through with today. And the extent to which material becomes in-depth discussions or not is up to you, really. There are a few things that I'd like you to go with. I pretty much set this slideshow up so that after a particular topic, there's a Q&A period. If there's something you need immediate answer to because I haven't gone into it in depth enough, feel free to interrupt any time, especially when there's only a few of us here. What I would like to do, though, is generally keep the questions to the end of that particular subject. So let's start. I want to make sure you can all see my screen that says division purpose on the top of it right now. Yes, sir. So we need to know is why are we doing all of these things? Think of it as a mission. We really need to help club members through the area directors meet the objectives of the club and the individuals, aid in various administration tasks, assist in the presentation of speech contests. As you all know, it goes from club contests to area contests and then to division contests. And the division contests are what you'd be directly in charge of administering. Assist in the training of area leaders and club officers. Many of you have already assisted in the training of area directors and in some club officer training already. Help clubs and areas distinguished achieve their distinguished goals. Well, before we can do any of these things, we really need to know what some of these things mean. We'll be trying to go through each of those as we go through this slideshow. First, I'm not sure that all of you know each other or know much about each other. So I just want to look at the area directors that we have. Catherine Denzine, I had not met until recently. She's from Lake Effects Club. She has a DTM. And because she works 12 hour shifts on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, she'll not be with us tonight, but she'll be reviewing this by video. Donna Caseborn may be in the same situation. Again, I'll note that, note that Catherine has been in Toastmasters about five years. On the other hand, Don has been Toastmasters about 15 years, belongs to three clubs, has her DTM, and she's in charge of Division C. In charge of Division E, Christina Owens, who I believe is connected to us. Are you in this session, Christina? I thought I just saw her. Saw her. Can you see if she's in the waiting room, Supervisor? I'm here. I just can't unmute, unmute quickly. Okay, good. If I got all of this right, she belongs to two clubs, an yes. IP5. Maybe you can tell us what an IP5 is. I know it's level five, but of which program? That is Innovative Planning and Pathways. And been in Toastmasters since 2017, as far as I can tell. Yes. Subramani, two clubs, been in Toastmasters since 2016. And what's EH5? Engaging humor. Oh, really? I've got to hear you giving some humorous speeches sometime soon. And Patricia, since 2020, two clubs she belongs to, but she's doing much more than just shows up here because she has been the leader for the website implementation, among other responsibilities when Zoom came about. So Patricia, can you tell me what PI1 is? Uh, no, I don't remember, <laughs> but I, I can tell you it's my third pathway. Persuasive influence, that's what it is. Oh, persuasion. Okay, that's, that's cool. Yeah. Now, one of the things I want to do to make sure that everybody that says they viewed this session actually viewed it is I want to ask each one of you, what is your favorite thing to do outside of Toastmasters? 
So let's start from the bottom of the list. Patricia, what's your favorite thing to do outside of Toastmasters? Oh, gosh, that's hard to say, Rick. I don't have favorites um, because my favorite thing to do is to do something I haven't done before. Oh, that's I cool. guess that's I guess that's my favorite. That's cool. Super money. I am pursuing my Taekwondo. Oh, really? Competitive or competitive Taekwondo? Not exactly competitive. At the age of 46, that is <laughs> difficult to be competitive. But I have a second degree black belt in Taekwondo. I'll testing for my third degree black belt in three years. Wow. Christina, how about you? Um, I would say my favorite thing to do is probably what's called OCR, which is obstacle course racing. So that involves running on trails and doing various obstacles along the way. Wow. How fun. <laughs> Sounds like fun. Did I see Donna sneak in here? Nope. Rakia snuck in. Oh, hi, Rakia. Hello. I'm just seeing what it's like to be on a cell phone. So I'm just <laughs> not involved. So this is our team. This is our team at the division level. Just a little bit about them. You can see we have people that are people that are from 2007 all the way through people that have just recently joined as, as Patty showing as of January of 2020. As I look through this list, I was really amazed at the extent to which leadership roles have been taken up by new people. A lot of times in the olden days, all these division directors would be people that have been in Toastmasters at least 10 years and more likely to be 15 or so. It's amazing to see people with five years or less picking up big leadership roles, and we need that to happen. This is the training agenda for today. You'll talk about five topics. Division teams. What's a division team? I'm division director. I shouldn't have a team with me, do I? Maybe you should. Division success plan. We'll talk about that exactly what is if you're not familiar. Use of the dashboard and reports for some very specific situations. Division speech contests and 2023 rule changes that may have a big impact on how your contests are administered. And then have some words about division council. So let's start with division teams. Officially, division teams have three components within the division, aside from the division director yourself. There's an assistant division director for program quality, an assistant division director for club growth, and the area directors are on your team. Have any of you ever used an assistant division director at all in the past? Or ever heard of one? Don't all speak up all at once. I want to emphasize this point because I note several times what comes up in this district is that people tend not to form teams to get activities done. People tend to get burned out. And the way you don't get burned out is you get other people to help you. We will walk through some of the ways these assistant division directors can do that. Let's start that now. Let's talk about an assistant director for program quality. As we walk down through these things that a assistant division director could be doing, we'll try to think of some examples and see how it could help you lighten the load on what you're doing as, or purported to be doing as a division director. So let's say, and by the way, just for reference, this is not something I've made up. This is all in the district leadership manual. You'll see all of these roles and all of these 
processes that I'm discussing today in that document someplace. So if you wanted to promote members' achievement of education awards, can you give an example of something that the assistant division director might do to do to promote members' achievement of education awards? Anybody? Let me ask the question differently then. Last year, we had lots of DTMs probably some DTMs in your own divisions. What type of recognition was given to those people that made DTMs? None. None, none at all. Did any division directors do that? I have to say it's my fault when I was division F director last year, I simply assumed it was being done by the district and it never happened. That's going to change this year. I am going to be making direct calls to clubs that have had division, had DTMs in the last year and award education awards to the individuals. It'd be really nice if that could be done at the division level this year, at least for maybe, if not DTMs, then how about some sort of recognition for people that achieved their fifth level? How could they support area directors in enhancing club quality? I will answer that question too, because I keep hearing this over and over and over again when I'm listening to people from international. They say, look, if you want to enhance your club quality, why aren't you doing moments of truth at the club level? And I don't think that the value is seen by most club members. I have done Moments of Truth a number of times and it pointed out things that clubs should change. Maybe what you do is you send a assistant director, assistant division director into a club that you think might have need for that. If a club is of low membership, there's gotta be a reason. And investigating that reason Sometimes a moment of truth can help with that. There's an example of where this, they may be able to support area directors in enhancing club quality. Let's try again. Let's see if you guys can come up with some thoughts on how to do this. Ensure that area directors visit each club in their areas at least twice a year and submit an area director's club visit report. Well, you do this as a, as a division director right now, right? Don't you look over the shoulders of the area directors and make sure that you're, they do their reports at least twice a year. Maybe that's something you can delegate to someone else working with you. And the rest of these fit into that same goal, encouraging areas to meet their distinguished goals, coordinating, conducting division speech contests, Example of that fourth one, encouraging areas to meet their distinguished goals. One problem that always seems to come up is when area directors leave their, their visits to the last minute and then something comes up and they can't get it done. Why couldn't the area director call on the assistant director of program quality and say, hey, could you go do this club visit for me now and get it done? And then the area director submits the, submits the area visit, but notes that it was done by somebody else. Coordinating conducting division speech contests. That is a lot of work. If you try to do that all yourself, well, I'll just say don't. Get some help. If not for an assistant director of program quality, get your help someplace else. You appoint the assistant director for program quality. This is the kind of thing you go to a friend and say, listen, I'm gonna need some help this year. Can you be my assistant in the division? You can call the name of it whatever you want, but these are the names, this one and this next one that are recommended by International. So let me just ask this question. 
Have any of you ever experienced this in any of your divisions before? Either assistants? No. No. Silver mining? No, sir. You didn't? You did not? Well, that's interesting because Subramani was an area director when I was division director for my first year into COVID. And we actually had a couple of people that were assistant directors, but it just means that I didn't implement them very well at that time. And, but let's talk a little bit about the assistant director for club growth. This, when I utilize someone like this, this is my metrics guy that I say, hey, listen, start watching these clubs. Look for warning signs. Warning signs that a club might be something like, well, of course, they're low membership. Might be something like, gosh, this club looks like it's kind of doing well, but it's not having much in the way of educational achievements. And when I examine it to find out how pathway enrollment looks like, none of their officers are pathways enrolled person to look at the metrics. So you have two team members, one that is roughly parallel to what the program quality director does at the district level, and the other that's roughly equivalent to what the club growth director does. You know, to be able to achieve distinguished, your division has to have a net increase of zero or a net decrease of zero in clubs. The other thing is, if you've got this person can be watching for clubs that are look like they maybe are going to fold or be susp suspended and know that for everyone that goes in that direction, we have to find one within that division to come aboard as a new club. That's something that maybe you can defer to an assistant because you don't have time to deal with it all the time. Now, part of this comes with just a discussion I had today with the division A director. She said, you know, when I go to meetings where people are doing a lot of things in the district and in the division, I always ask them, how do you have time to do all of that? And the answer to that question should be, I don't know if it is or not what she gets back, but the answer to that should be, I don't do it all myself. I've got a team of people that are doing it for me. If I have to go to, to Hawaii for two weeks of for two weeks of hard work in Hawaii, then I've got people that'll take care of the division for me while I'm gone. The next obvious set is division teams is area directors. We're right now way behind. Division A needs four, C needs two, E is complete, F needs one, and H needs one. Because E is complete, I have asked the Division E director to give us some tips on how she managed to get those teams together, get those area directors together, and maybe there's some strategies that she employed that might be able to help the rest of us fill the needed slots. And with that, Christina, you have the floor. Thank you, Rick. Good evening, everyone. I will say, first of all, I don't know if my strategy is more dumb luck or if there were actually strategies involved, but I, will, I did probably have four different things that I tried to get my area directors in place. So first of all, there's been a bit of a um, tradition in Division E, at least it was for me, where it felt like the previous area director prior to exiting the role helped to find their replacement. So that may not help you much this year, but going forward in your division, if you want to help get the next division director, find area directors, maybe encourage your area directors to find their replacement for the following year. So I started with asking, well, number one, for myself, I was an area director last year in Division E, so I found my replacement. 
by asking a good friend of mine who's in a club, one of my clubs that I attend. To find the others, the other three, I asked previous area directors for Division E from last year if they knew of anyone that would be interested in fulfilling the role. I did find one of those people who was interested in doing it themselves. Again, they felt they would, they would learn more doing it the second year. So that was where I got my second area director. And then the third was with networking. So asked around to see if anyone had any leads in some other, in these last two areas I had, and someone had a lead and that person accepted when we, when I asked them to be area director. And then the fourth one I asked in a club that was not, it's in my other club, but my, my corporate club at work. It is not in my division. It's not in division E, my club is not, but this person lives close enough to those clubs in this area that they were willing to be an area director for me. So don't be afraid to reach outside of your division to find area directors either. And as you've noticed, there's been a lot of the word ask. So ask, people are probably not gonna to come to you knocking on your door, begging to become an area director. When I became area director last year, I had no intentions of doing it that year, but it was when I was asked that I considered it. So I think people feel good when you ask them. They, it feels like you see something in me that I would be good at this, this task, this leadership ability, this leadership opportunity. And frame the question that way. Let them know that you do see those qualities in them and you would like to see them on their leadership journey in, in Toastmasters to gain experience. And this would be a perfect way to do it. And also reassure them that they don't have to know everything. So I have some very new Toastmasters as my area direct, one of my area directors, and then some people that just don't feel super comfortable with it yet, but I know they have the skills to do it. So making sure you know, they know you're gonna be walking alongside them and helping them along the way, that they're not alone in it. So specifically reach out to people. I mean, you can broadcast an email out to your clubs in your district and your division, sorry. But if you can go to specific people and then just ask other people if they know of anyone, I think those kind of personal referrals probably get you further along than just putting out a broadcast email. Thank you, Christina. You all can all clap for her too, you know. You don't have to just sit there not clapping. <laughs> I will say that it's always good to try something innovative. Donna has attempted to get three area directors. Oh, she only needs two now from outside the district. You can do that, however, in order for a person outside the district to be a area director, they must join a club within the district. So they're no longer outside the district. Yeah, well, that puts them back in the district, but but you, you get what I'm saying. So it'll be interesting to see how many of those, she asked for three outside, she must have gotten one already. I have to find out how that has gone. So you now have my vision of what a division team would look like. Any questions on that subject before we go on to the next? I do have a question, Rick. So actually one thing, one on my area director, back when I first joined Toastmasters and I was a club officer and I went to training, I remember that day, it was a bit back when we only did in-person training, someone, they had a sheet and it asked on there, would you be interested in being an area director or some other kind of district role? Do we do anything like that anymore? That question came specifically on the area visit form. Okay. When the area director went in to visit a club, that was one of the questions that was asked. I'm not sure, the new forms that went in last year, Subramani, is that question still there? That question is still there. It's still there? Yes. So you should be able to gather that information from your area directors if they took the time to ask the question and get that feedback from the clubs. In my experience in the last two years, I didn't get any reasonable feedback from that question. It may have been mm -hmm. because people were meeting virtually and just never really got to that level of discussion. 
Other questions? If not, I will go on. Quick question, Rick. Go ahead. Uh, for the assistant director roles, are they official Toastmaster roles as recognized by the division or are they ad hoc roles uh, that we can nominate anyone to? You appoint, you don't okay. nominate. So you appoint and you'll see in some further slides, there are specific, specific processes in which those people are involved. Okay. But will they get recognition at the district level? A commission? Recognition. There is no, there's no district level role that is a checkbox that said I did X. But what they will get, in my opinion, is these people will be the primary persons that should be considered for division directors next year. Right? They've sat, they've sat with you for the year. They learned program quality. They learned, learned club growth. What a great stepping stone. I never had that when I went in any of the places I was where I went from area director to division director. And I should have. I have a question, Rick. If somebody takes on the role of an assistant, anything, are they still precluded from participating in the speech contest? They are not. They're not because the only limitations refer to elected positions. These are not elected positions. And we'll be going through later in this slide, we'll go through the actual wording of that particular limitation as it was placed in the rule book this year. We made it to the first topic. Now I wanna talk about division success plan and say this, last year with seven divisions, there was one division success plan submitted, one. So in my mind, I say, okay, if you don't have a division success plan, how can your whole team be working together and know what they have to achieve? There are probably some elements that they have to achieve, but the division success plan should be for each division director and all the area directors, and though it's not listed here, all of their assistant directors. What is it? Well, it's the division success plan. The document associated with that is at the location here. After this meeting, I'll be forwarding everyone a copy of these slides. So you don't have to write down any of these, these URLs or anything like that. So you'll have them there. That'll take it to the empty division success plan. The division success plan is really a strategy and tactics document where you can say, I have to get X number of people, X number of clubs distinguished in order to be successful for the purposes of the division success plan. How do I do that? What clubs should I try to rely on? What are my measures of success? And when, this should, when should this be done? Well, I didn't want to go there yet. It should be done the sooner the better. You know, if everything was in place the way it should be, and we had all our area directors in place as of June 30th, we would have already gone through division success plans, had time to deal with those area directors and your assistants and formulate a plan. As it is now, if we're fortunate enough to get the area directors in by September 30th, it would be really nice if before the end of the month of October, division success plans could be formulated for each division. It doesn't take that long to do it, but it does take discussions with your area directors and your assistants. Let me give you some examples. One part of the division success plan looks exactly like this. You take your club base from the various reports inside of Toastmasters International for your particular division. And then 
you have to say how many of those clubs have to be distinguished for my division to be distinguished. So in this case, or in this case, in the case, 40% of clubs have to be at one level of distinguished or another for your division to be called distinguished. For select distinguished, 45%. For presidents distinguished, 50% plus you have to add a club. So that's a net gain of one club. This is the kind of thing you fill out in the document. The natural thing would then be to go back and look at last year, find out what your distinguished clubs look like, and count ones that you can rely on to start filling in these boxes. The next most important part of this entire document is what I call the situation analysis. As a matter of fact, if you start looking at the division success plan document, you're gonna see a whole bunch of things at the beginning that refer to how are we going to process everything if we have a conflict? What are we going to do to maintain the values of, of Toastmasters? Those are what I call softer questions. The real hard part where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, are in the situation analysis and the document on the prior screen, the portion of the document on the prior screen. One thing that you might want to list here is the clubs you think you will need or will be able to bring to distinguish. And the reason I say that is because I looked carefully at President's Distinguished Clubs in the last year. There are no new President's Distinguished Clubs. They're, they're clubs that have been distinguished for usually 10 years so that that club knows what it's doing. It's a little bit more in and out on the distinguished versus the select distinguished. But the point I'm trying to make is you can probably rely on a President's Distinguished Club to be President's Distinguished this year. You have to do your work at the margin. Where are the clubs that almost made it? What do we have to do to move them up? And then you develop a strategy and tactic set to go after that. This entire filling out of this document is administered by the division director. You are the person in charge of problem solving and putting this together. When I did this in charge of the divisions, I usually wrote up a lot of the base information and then we, as a set of area directors and division directors, discussed what we might have to do. Now, to tell you the truth, it didn't work out very well for me in those two years because those were the two COVID years. And I thought everything was adjusted for in after the first year. And it got even worse in the second year. We have to make positive progress. In the last year, we went from 148 clubs down to 99. Let me say that again. In the last year, we went from 148 clubs down to 99. And what I did after reports on those clubs, some of them anyway, we should have known right at the beginning that those clubs were not going to make it. They had not been meeting. When they were meeting, there were four or five people out of the 20 that appeared on their appeared on things, et cetera. The earlier we can know that's a problem, the better. And the start is this document. The start is also the area to visits, visits made by the area directors. Here's the other important piece I see on this document. These are the people that agreed with the strategy and tactics in this document in this particular year. Notice the people involved, the division director, the area directors, division F club extension is basically the, what we have come called in this document, the, the assistant division director for club growth. And then the division F less logistics is really the person that was in charge of program quality. Although we only used logistics. We didn't expand any clubs. So this gentleman that was the Division F for 
club extension, never even had a chance, never had a lead to follow up on during that time period. The point I'm trying to make here is this is your team. Put your team together. We're working on these parts. I suspect not much has been done in these other two. Let's get those assistant division director people in place. And it may be that due, um, due to the nature of your particular division, maybe you want to give them different names. You need them to work on something else. I don't care. They're appointed by you to perform the role that you need to have done. Any questions on the division success plan? The division success plan, I will say, gets filed when you've created it. It gets filed inside of the TI website, and that's accessible by division directors and by district officers associated with your division. So. It's in one of the lists of things you can get in Leadership Central, Division Success Plans. No other questions? Let's go on to dashboards and reports. Now, some of you are very familiar with these dashboards, I'm sure. Some of us that have been with Toastmasters in the beginning knew when there only was one report. But I want to talk about these in the context of problem solving also. When I look at, as a division director, if I look at a club and I'm trying to solve a problem at the club, I look at all three of these things. First of all, the distinguished performance reports. This URL is all fully loaded and you can go down and look at it. This is called in non-formal technology, the dashboard. And in, in my opinion, the only reason it's called the dashboard is because I don't know if you can see this URL. The URL is dashboards.toastmasters.org. Every place else is referred to as a distinguished performance report. We'll look up some, some examples of what we might be able to see in such a report. Pathways adoption. I guarantee you, if officers of a club have not adopted pathways, that club is going nowhere. Guaranteed, I've seen it happen too many times over the past two or three years. It just infects the entire club and the entire club is headed in the wrong direction unless we can turn that around. Every director club visit reports. We'll look at some that have already been filed. One of the things that's kind of neat about these, these club reports, and I didn't realize it until I started being area director two years ago here in this district. Every time I file an area director club report, it copy goes to the president and a copy goes to all the district officers and to the and to the division director also. We'll talk about that a little more later because there's a trend that I don't like to see and it's not helpful that we'll cover when I get to looking at some of the some of those reports. So let's go to the next and look at first piece. Distinguished reports, distinguished performance reports. What are the requirements? Can anyone here tell me the requirements for a division to be distinguished? Anyone got it memorized? Net decreases zero clubs. Net decreases zero clubs, correct. I'm cheating because you said that earlier. <laughs> well, I've said I've said almost all of these earlier. Yes, you probably have. Let's look at this. First of all, it's only stated in one place. You won't find this because it's a very unusual situation. You have to have at least three areas. If you only have two areas. However it happened, it doesn't matter. You cannot be distinguished. No net club loss, Christina just said, and we just went through this on the other chart. Distinguished, 40% of clubs have to be distinguished. Select distinguished district uh, division, 
45% of clubs have to be distinguished and presidents distinguished 50% plus one club, one club net growth. Well, let's take a look. I say in my division, because this slide was old, but this is last year. This is a part of the distinguished performance reports, but I've looked at just the areas rather than the, the individual clubs. So walking through this, it also states the goals for the division, for the division to be, division goals for the division to be, yeah, how many paid clubs do they have to have for the division to be distinguished or select distinguished, 15? They have to have 16 for this because their base was 15. No net club growth or, or no net club loss, 15, 15 for the division goals. And then 16 if you're going to be presidents. This is all up here right in front of you. You don't have to memorize this stuff. You go pull out one of these reports. Notice then also the requirement for the distinguished clubs, number of distinguished clubs are up here. Division F only had five, only had five distinguished clubs last year. I was not part of a distinguished division last year. So let's look to see what we can glean out of the different areas. Area 61, club base of four. Two paid clubs, both of which were distinguished. Is Area 61 distinguished? No. Why not? Because it doesn't have, it has a loss of two clubs. Correct. Notice the area goes up here. Four paid clubs, four paid clubs, or five paid clubs for distinguished, select distinguished, and president's distinguished. Now, area 63, hey, got a base of three clubs, four of which are paid. Did that, why isn't that distinguished? Because the clubs within the paid clubs are not distinguished. There are no distinguished clubs whatsoever in the entire area. Area 64. Two distinguished clubs, two paid clubs, but you already have the situation. The base clubs of five lost the club during the year. And area 66. Area 66 is almost okay, right? Mm -hmm. One more distinguished club and that area would have been distinguished. One more. Had the right base, missed it here. I think this dashboard is something you want to start using at least once a week. It's a little bit difficult sometimes because I have a hard time figuring out when in earth the Toastmasters International website is really up to date. <laughs> but, but you will find that it's pretty good in this particular kind of report because it gives you the dates that are available. And as you look at it, at the URL that was in the previous slide, you just pull it down and you will see. Here, you're looking for warning signs. What if we're halfway through the year and none of the clubs are distinguished yet? Then you could drill down further in this report to start finding out things like, how many points does the club have and where are they coming from? What's missing? Actually, that's something to have your area director do. Your area director should be looking at this before they visit the club to find out what the problems are here. I have seen this particular report show for an entire year, there were no goals met insofar as achieving levels. No educational goals met, met at all. Can any of you suggest what the problem could be? Not enrolled in pathways. Not enrolled in pathways could be one, yes. Another People, idea? They do, they do speeches, but they don't do pathways projects or count them as such. 
Okay, so they're back in pathways, and... they're not, not doing them. Mm -hmm. I did have this happen in one club last year with neither of those were the answers. They're not meeting. No, <laughs> they were definitely <laughs> meeting. They were definitely meeting and people were giving speeches. Same yeah. people giving speeches over and over and over again. Nope. Credo was going to a different club. Nope. I'll start. Here was the problem. Every member was completing their levels in pathways. But the VPE was not recording them in the TI component ah. to report them. A two-step process. And that is more that is more of a problem than you would think. But the first thing I try to do, if I see a situation like that, is you need to look to see if the VPE ever attended officer training. If they didn't, then you likely know what the problem is right there. Or especially if the VPE is not enrolled in pathways. <laughs> that makes it even worse. So you can tell a lot of things from these. And that's one of the things I think you need to help your club, your area directors in. Because especially if they're new, they may not be used to looking at the dashboard. And if they are looking at the dashboard, they may not be used to distinguishing what a problem might be. Another look at some other report here is this one. You can find out if a club, which members are, have pathways adoption, et cetera, by looking at the membership list or the officer list. But I like to look at the pathways adoption report. And here's a summary of that report. I pulled out some columns that we don't really need. Let's look at these clubs. Kentucky Farm Bureau, 26 members, 65% total member pathways adoption rate. All officers are pathways enrolled. New members are not. Only two out of three new members are. So what do you think's going on? Anyone have any ideas what's going on with Kentucky Farm Bureau here? They're not helping their members get enrolled in pathways and with the program right away. And I'll say this is a corporate club. The corporate club does not require attendance. <laughs> and sometimes in corporate clubs, you'll find people that will sign up just to be part of the membership of the club and will not really participate that much. That's not an unusual situation. We have a club that has 80 members in division A, I think it was, has 80 members in it and are not achieving much in the way of educational levels. It's a corporate club. There's some sort of panache associated and it's a social social situation. They may be okay. I'm a little concerned about this new member rate though, but if they're just signing up because that is what their corporation says they should do and not really participating, it might be a sign of that. But if I was an area director going into the club, I would ask that question. What's really going on here? How can it be that new members, now that says we've had three new members this year and only two of them are signed up. That might not be a big deal because it's really three out of only two, right? I look at communicators, this happens to be my club. We may distinguish for the first time in five years last year. And these two members just joined. I know this because what we do to get new members into pathways is the VPE sits with that person when they first come into the club and helps them select it. That's all that counts whether or not they're enrolled in pathways. This person joined and just hadn't been back to a club meeting yet. These, these happened in the last in the last meeting in the month of August. So I happen to have some inside knowledge here that we're okay. Look at Humana Speaks Up. Nine members in the club. 
seven of which are officers, or at least there's seven officers position, but they're all enrolled in pathways. What's going on with this club? Any ideas what you can see what might be going on with this club? What about they're this not, number? They're not adding members. They're not adding members. And so we can't really tell from this report, you've got zero, zero new members and no new members have been enrolled in Pathways. Well, that makes sense. You, you can't make something up. The club is low membership. What happens if they go under eight? They'll be officially low membership. And if they go through two dues collection periods with less than eight, what happens? Deleted. The club is suspended. You lose that club. I think if I was division governor, division director, I mean, this year, I'd watch these careful clubs, be very careful these clubs at the margin and make sure that your area director's time is primarily spent on trying to build these clubs at the margin. Because look at this, if they go down by two, they're out. And if it's two quarters in a row, they're, they're completely out. Just keep them at nine somehow. Find out what's keeping them down around nine when all the other people in the same area have huge membership in clubs. This club on top, these two larger membership clubs and one on the bottom, those are both corporate clubs. Communicators is public. Humana, I'm not sure. I think it's corporate also. But let's look at this last one, 31 members. Pathways enrollment, 74%. Officers, at least most of the officers are pathways enrolled, but I would be checking to find out if the VPM is, or not the VPM, the VPE. The VPE is, we've got a problem. And they've added three new members, but only one of them has joined pathways. So that's something to work on. I can now go, if I'm an area director and have this information, and have discussed it with you and maybe look at things we could try for the club to find out what's going on, we can now go in armored and we can ask very specific questions of the club officers. Area director visit reports. We have three area directors scheduled so far, three, I wouldn't even say it that way. This report contains three visits so far, one in division F and two in division H. None of these club visits have happened, or at least if they have happened, they haven't been documented here. Who can tell me the drop dead date for the first round of area director visits? November 30th. November 30th at midnight. Eastern, no, at midnight, I think it's whatever time they have midnight in, was it Rocky Mountain time or something in Colorado? But don't wait for that long. I've always lectured my area directors, get these done as soon as possible for the first round, especially. If we had all the area directors in place on September 30th, we could have been urging them to have completed most of their visits in July in early August. The early we get them done, you know as well as I do, the early we get these done, the more help we can be to the club and clubs. I hadn't seen any division E's in here, Christina. Not Gotta yet. They're working on it. Good. <laughs> Got to get them to start making visits. Challenge for all of you is you've got division, except for Christina, I guess, is you've got the area directors coming on board, hopefully, before the end of this month. They have only two months to get their area visits done. They will need help. They'll need help, your help to do that, I'm sure. Especially if they come in and they haven't had a lot of experience before. These are the three main reports that I came to rely on as division director. Any questions in this subject? Rick, one question on the first report the paid clubs, is that only show after the members, is that when the membership dues are due after that time frame, or how, what does that mean exactly? 
That's as of, depending upon when this report was run, either as <laughs> of the last, um, let's see how I want to say this. As of the last dues collection period, however, however, if you paid under eight, you can, you may be counted as low, but it's still paid. But if you're the second eight, you're not a paid club anymore because you're suspended. If you, if you have to take dues, not all at once, I urge people get eight in before October 1st in this dues paying period. Because if you get eight in before October 1st, even if you've got another eight to collect, then you're not counted as low membership. So in this case, by October 1st, get at least eight collected dues for every club. That's what you want to have. You never want to get to that second one and be under because then you get suspended and lots of nasty things happen. There's an enrollment, re-enrollment fee. You've got to pay back dues and all kinds of things. Most clubs that get suspended don't recover. So Rick, so the like area 61 here, you had two paid clubs. Does that mean that the, two, the other two were suspended? Yes. Okay. The other two were suspended. So if you paid late, no. What you just said, if you don't have eight in, they don't care if you pay late, you're still a low. And if you do there that twice. Some, there is some flexibility in that. There is, I believe, a soft 30 days. And the only reason I know that is because I know that, that corporate clubs sometimes take a while to get their monies paid out to international, particularly for paying direct. It has to go through a PO process. I've seen some clubs appear to be sus suspended. And then I look later in the month of October and see that they're now back in good standing. I know that to do that, you have to go to international for an exception. The problem is if you ever get suspended, you don't have access to any of these reports and you have to go through lots of rigmarole. Don't do it. Don't rely on any type of margin. Get at least eight clubs paid before October 1st and before April 1st, eight members in each club. Any other questions on this topic? Next subject then, division speech contests. There's a lot of points in here. I am not going to go in detail through each one. You should say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but, but you can use this particular slideshow as guidance and that's why I'll be forwarding it to you. I wanna cover three things. I want to cover lightly the 10 steps to doing division contests. And I want to, in detail, look at some of the rule changes and in the format. So let's go. Format. The format is not yet fully decided. The district council voted more than 70% of that district council recommended hybrid clubs, hybrid, hybrid contests for the division. I have not, I, I sat back and looked at the statistics that I could tell the role of the person that voted. I expected to see something like the club VPEs and the club presidents would all vote for hybrid and the actual area directors and division directors would be voting for virtual. That's not the way it happened. It's split and the roles of the people involved were mixed. I don't know. We have a district executive council meeting on 927. Attend if you want to be heard. At that meeting, I will be proposing as, or I'll have somebody be introducing motions to accept what was specified by the district council in all cases. They said hybrid in all three levels, hybrid in area, hybrid in district, in division, and hybrid at the district. The District Executive Committee 
can vote those proposals down. I can only note, I will not take sides. I'm going to faithfully present whatever district council said. I do know that virtual requires simply virtual meeting capability. Hybrid requires a physical site, special video capability, and there's guidance from international that they said they would provide in the second Toastmasters quarter of this Toastmasters year. So that means sometime before December 31st. After the 27th, we will know. If it comes out of the 27th that we're doing hybrid, there's a lot of work to be done for the division and for your area directors. Requires you to have a physical site. In the olden days, pre-COVID, I don't know if you all experienced this, but everything was in person. Each area director had to find a place to be able to do their contest and that was done generally at some club location. Some club provided the location. We didn't have this special video capability, but everything was done in person. So acquiring a physical site might not, might not be that difficult for a club, uh, for an area. For a division, it might be more difficult because you need a larger facility, right? It's time to start looking at that because that will cause you some problems if you don't start attacking the physical site right away if you do need it. These steps in my timeline, we, we know that the division contest has to take some place, take place someplace between the 15th of March and the 4th of April. Probably the longest or most difficult planning part of the cycle is if we're going to hybrid for you to select the division site. So that's something to keep in mind to see how, how things happen after the 27th. Step three to four. I plot these out as being done by the 11th, by the, by the 1st of November. Pick a contest master, pick a chief judge. The chief judge is something that's good to be there in the beginning because as you acquire judges, you can simply send all the eligibility information over to the chief judge and have him pass on whether or not those people are appropriate judges right early. I will tell you from my experience, the longest task is finding judges. You'll see the rule book, you need to have seven. There's a bunch of rules about eligibility, things like that. Step five, international speech contest. Unless something changes on December 20, on September 27th deck, the second one will be evaluation speech contest. And then inform your areas once you have selected your date, then they can plan when their latest date is. Now, when I say selecting your date, what I want you to do is get it on the district calendar. If you don't know how to do that, the person to contact is David Klopfenstein, the PRM, or Patty will tell you what to do, <laughs> things like that. But I want them on the calendar for a very selfish reason. I want to be able to visit each and every division contest and help with that contest. If they're all scheduled at the same time and the last date in the, in the selected period, if they're all scheduled on the 15th of April at the same time, every, I don't want to, I can't split myself up. There's five of us, five of you all, we simply ought to be able to select a contest time that doesn't step in other contest times. It also gives another benefit because as a division director, one of your most active judging pools are the other division directors, right? No conflicts with clubs, things like that. A Zoom master for your division contest. Zoom masters, we don't always use Zoom. I know in division F, 
we used what is called web webex webex we use webex you just have to plan for how you're going to administer that situation selected judges we talked about that already minimum seven look at the eligibility send everybody here's something that we don't do and they didn't even do that at international this year it's very disappointed they did get the judging eligibility sent to the chief judge for me i was eligible for for judging in a particular contest at the international they didn't even give us rule books now it's not something i have a rule book sitting in my back pocket all the time i would have expected them to do that that's an important thing to make sure that every judge gets a rule book As you get further down, now we're talking about getting into the beginning of your contest time period. The chief judge has to do these things. You can't select a tiebreaker judge. Only the chief judge can do that. Can't even tell you who it is. Get him a rule book. Get him judges eligibility forms that are filled out by the judges. Chief judge then approves or disapproves the eligibility of the judges you sent him. Steps nine to 10, contest agenda rough cut. Again, 215 is what is recommended. But again, this is something you can easily have your assistant division director for your assistant division for director for PQD to put together those paperwork things for you. And I recommend always outlining for the contest master, even if it's yourself, outline those opening statements. If you look at the rule book, it specifically tells you the things you should put in those opening statements. Take a look at the rule book and do that. Make sure everything you have that can possibly be ready is ready by 215. I've said 215 in here because 215, 215 lets you do this and prepare the outline Everything after 215 depends upon what's happening at the area contests, right? You can't tell, other than a rough outline, you can't tell how many contest participants you have. You can't tell what clubs they're in, so you can decide in the final eligibility of your judges. You don't have enough information to do much else. Lastly, I want to call your attention to these rule changes, and I'm going to actually read them here. I hate it when people do that, but I'm going to do that. In addition to be eligible to compete in the International Speech Contest, remember this ruling is limited to the International Speech Contest. If we have an evaluation contest, doesn't matter. A member must have earned certificates of completion of levels one and two of any path in the Toastmasters Pathways Learning Experience or earned a Distinguished Toastmaster Award. The prior rule said that if you had completed six speeches in a CC manual, you could participate. That's no longer the case. Only DTMs from either program or people that have completed levels one and two of a path are allowed to compete. That eliminates a fair number of people that have been running based on completing programs in the legacy program. That is no longer the case, except if they're a DTM, it doesn't matter whether it's completed in the legacy program or anyplace else. F, further down in the document, candidates for elected. That's an important move right there. And this word also candidates for elected district leader positions for the term beginning in the subsequent July 1st are ineligible to serve as a contest official or test speaker at the area division or district level. So let's take an example. Your contest is on, let's say, April 15th. 
you've decided you want to run for PQD. If you wanted to run for PQD, that information has to be filed well before that time. Nominations are probably open December 1st. This says, if you are a candidate for an elected leadership position, you cannot participate in the contest. That means you can't be the contest master in your own contest. You can't have any role in your own contest. Cannot serve as a contest official or as a test speaker. You may be able to serve as a contestant interviewer, but I wouldn't risk it. That's, so Rick, does that, you can't be a ballot counter or a timer? You cannot be a ballot counter. You cannot be, that's a contest official. And there's a list of them in the book, what constitutes a contest official. In other words, what they don't want you to do, and I don't know when this ever happened. I haven't seen this happen in any of the districts I've been in, but they don't want you to use a visible role as a means for you getting a some sort of PR for your elected position. And this was stated in a ruling in a little bit different way in the past, but it wasn't even in the contest rules. Now it's in the contest rules. But here's something to note. What about an area director? If I want to be an area director next year and in our district, it's not elected. May I serve as a contest official in my own contest this year? The answer is yes. You're not an elected district leader. You're an appointed district leader if you're an area director. So let's take another example. I am definitely going to be declaring for a for district director next year. Am I going to be able to be the contest master for the international speech contest at the district level this year? No. Well, the answer is it depends because it's this one, candidates. If we have in advance of the contest, if we have a district meeting that goes to an election, a district, in other words, if the district council meeting comes before the district conference and I get elected, then I'm no longer a candidate. Oh well, yeah, that's what we did this year. Yeah, that was called by some the Rick Holtmeyer rule <laughs> because I was always pressing them to split the to split that out last year. So the two key words, elected and candidates. I think if you want to become, let's even say you're going to run for the same district position next year. You could decide because you want to run your own area contest that you're not going to announce you're going to run from the floor because you're not a candidate until your announce is running from the floor. So you can play some games of this, but I recommend that you don't. <laughs> but in the, our case, again, if it's a district, if it's a division leader, that's a district leader, you're a candidate until after the district election takes place. You could serve as a contest official at the district contest, right? but you probably couldn't at the division contest because your division contest will not, will not be before the district contest, before the district elections, district council meeting. Is that all clear? Just use those two words and see that they apply and that'll tell you. And this other one, number nine, the contest chair may appoint a contest master in such cases. However, they're telling you now what you have to call that person. It's got to be called the contest toastmaster. I don't know why there's any confusion. We always call them the contest master, but now you have to apply this particular term. Some of these rules I think are a little silly, 
The real thing is there's no enforcement of that. <laughs> if you decide to call him contest master, what are they going to do about it? There's nothing they can do. But if you want to follow rules, this is what you want to do. And here's the last one. This one started last year, but I saw so many people that just did not read the old rule book. This is important. This is at all contests. The timer with the stopwatch is the only person, I want to put it this way, is the only person that maintains and delivers to the chief judge the written record of elapsed time of each speech in the speech contest record sheet and instructions for timers. So that says how many time record sheets are given out? One and only one. The person that is using the timing device is completely separate from the person using the watch, the stopwatch and recording the time. One and only one. There have been lots of variations I've seen during the past year and, it's, and the variations just cause confusion. What happens if both of them are recording something and got a little different time? Well, you don't have both of them recording. What if my stopwatch broke? Well, if the stopwatch broke, that constitutes a breaking of the timing device. And therefore, the contestant is allowed a diff 30 additional seconds. That's clearly documented in the rules. Don't let anyone try to tell you different than this rule. You'll find it in the rule book. So why, do we need, why do we need two timers then? One is to watch the stopwatch. The other is to display the lights or the cards, whatever you're having to do. That's it. Other Q&A for the division speech contests. I just want to mention, Rick, I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not, but last year, Region 6, from the region standpoint, created a, a certification for judges and people took the certification class and then added their name to a list of people that were willing and able and qualified to judge in anybody's contest from a Zoom perspective. Yes, and I, I, used, I used those people in my contest last year, but I'm trying to get something different done this year. I'm, I have, some of you may have gotten email, you should have gotten email, ad, email notifications from David Kleffenstein about opportunities for service at the district level. Mm -hmm. One of those is district chief judge. That district chief judge will be responsible for quality of judges and for qualifying the judges. So what they did in region six will be mirrored in division district 11 also. So the, that, that will, so if you're interested in doing that, district chief or somebody you know is interested in doing that, that district chief judge is something that person should apply for. I want to have a district 11 list of qualified judges, and I want to have people that are judging get qualified by at least going through the standard training classes. I, I've watched judges that do things like, oh, this number, I, I'm now judging the fourth candidate, but I want to compare what this person did to the first candidate. No, we don't do that. Right. And, and things like that. I've, I've seen a lot of that. And I've also heard people say things like, well, I don't like, didn't like the wording that person used, and therefore I marked him to make sure he could never win. That's not right. <laughs> It's not the way you do it. You mark down the number of points that you have on that particular facet of the speech that you're judging, and that's all you can do. And I, I might add that the reason there's a hot button for me is because the better your judges are at the district level, the greater the chance your contestant has of doing well at the higher levels. 
I'm firmly convinced of that. Quality judges make for quality candidates. Other questions? No, yes. Well, how many of you people have planned your division councils for this year? Division directors, how many have planned it? Anyone? How many of you have ever attended a division council meeting? So let's talk about division council composition. And I just want to understand, make sure we understand what we're talking about. In the olden days before COVID, most districts had division councils that took place. Typically, they took place at a certain level of officer training. So for example, in district six that I knew very well, there were three levels of officer training. One was the district level, TLI, what we call the TLI. The next level was at the division. And after officer training at the division level, all of the area directors and the division directors would get together and go through some status reports. What's happening in this division? What's happening with certain clubs in this division and have discussions. And then when we got to the area training, the same thing would happen for the area. So when I first came here as an area director, I was almost unheard of, but I did that at the, when we had meetings still in person and it worked to a certain extent, but it's a culture change that should take place. You all should be able to do this. I think it's simpler than you think. Let's just walk through that. Who comes to a division council meeting? Well, the division director, the area directors, and the two assistants. What? Am I still here? Do you see, still see my screen? Okay, because I got a message saying I've been signed out. <laughs> I'm glad it isn't. What the <laughs> division council, division director, simply convene. What we did when we used to have to go up two hours and drive up every on Saturdays to come to deck meetings and, and things like that up into the church in the middle of Indianapolis, we each, each division director had a table. Right, we sat down around that table and we discussed information, exchange information. I was, I didn't like that because I didn't like to drive up two hours and drive back two hours for things we could have probably taken place, taking discussion we could have probably had over the telephone. What do we want to accomplish? Well, the purpose of these meetings is to convey information that helps us assist clubs, areas, and divisions. So for example, there's a club that, if for example, there's a club you're having trouble with. The area director is pulling his hair out and saying, I can't figure out what to do with this. Isn't it nice to be able to convene the other area directors and the division director and your assistants to work on a plan? Why not? What also is the benefit is that other area directors may have knowledge or have had experience, or even you may have had knowledge or had experience that that area director needs to be able to solve the problem. These meetings with that composition by the request of Toastmasters International now, by the manual, are twice a year with four no weeks notice on each. I will tell you that the distinguished districts I talk to at the international conference, they do this much more often than that. And those are the ones that are really doing well. We need to start someplace. You are supposed to give four weeks notice to each meeting. My suggestion is try to do this in conjunction with some other kind of meeting you're coming to anyway. For example, if you're coming to a deck 
meeting or a district council meeting, could be after the district council, do a division council, why not? Things like that. Please consider doing this during your next year. Questions answered on district council. How long have I been talking, by the way? So I'm going to stop my share at the moment. And find it's now 827. I've already been talking for an hour and a half. That's close enough to two hours, so you can be done with hearing me talk. I want to say a couple of things that look a little strange to me sometimes, but really feel good. I feel really good about looking at people that have not been with Toastmasters very long, taking over positions of officership in clubs. I'm astonished at the number of people that are here yet less than two years and are presidents of the club. It's amazing to me. And I think it's great. Now we need to generate that in our divisions and in our district. We need to have people that can give a little bit and learn a lot to become comfortable with jumping to the next position. This problem with acquiring area directors has been a problem in this district ever since I've been here, since 2017. We have not built people that have learned enough to have confidence to go to that next level. That is one of the things we have to do this year. We do that by area, by making assistance at this level and by making assistance at the area level. I'm doing area director training in two weeks. It's going to have the same kind of concepts embedded in it, so it won't be anything new. There are also two official area director assistant positions that you can probably guess their names. Area director, assistant area director for program quality and area assistant director for club growth. It's not just a problem with getting people to help offload you. It's a, it's a process by which we can start the training process with hands-on by people who are not yet ready, either by themselves or by our point of view, for taking the next level. Number one district last year was one in India. They get more area directors than they need. They turn down area directors every year. And the way that they do that is through similar things I've been talking to. Plus, they go to the clubs every year and have the club nominate people to be considered for area director. That's the kind of thing we need to build. It's going to change the district, but it's going to change the district slowly because the actual cultural change here. And it's been a while since it took, if it took us five years to be where we're at, maybe it'll take us another five years to change. But my vision of this district is we're going to end up with a much smoother transition by June 30th of next year. By June 30th of next year, I wanna have all area directors selected. I wanna have all division directors selected. I wanna have the, the training sessions already planned and staffed for the first round of area director training, uh, for the first round of club officer training, I mean, and area director training and division director training. If we had all that in place by June 30th, we could have done all these trainings within the month of July. That's where we wanna go give us a head start on the year rather than catching up from behind. I see someone sent me a chat message. Good suggestion from Carol who's listening here. She says, maybe you can get a March calendar out now and ask who wants which Saturday. First come, first get it. Now's the time to choose the date rather than plan around it. The thing is, right now, you have to do two things to get a date. You first of all have to get it on Rikia's calendar 
because she or her group are responsible for the Zoom sessions. Then you have to get it on David's calendar who maintains the website's calendar. What I do when I need a meeting is I just send a note directly to both of them and say, I need this meeting on this date. This is when it's going to be. Get that out. Get that out now. And I'll, I will be giving them instructions to say if there needs to be, if there ends up being a conflict, I'll adjudicate that. So get the information in fast. That's my, that's my advice on that. Choose the dates. Any other questions or advice? Thank you, Carol. Then I will say this to all of you. You have qualified for your four hours of training taking part on this time of the year. Those of you that have attended, the two that have not attended will have to view the tapes offline. I think one of the area, one of the division directors was in late and upon discussion with her, she's going to get her first two hours from viewing the first area director training because a lot of that information is transferable. And then we'll review the tapes, not tapes, you know what I mean, the videos for, for this particular meeting and that'll constitute the four hours. Any questions on anything? I'm sending you this. This, I just said I'm sending you this videotape. That's what I said in my head. I'm sending you this slideshow so you didn't have to take so many, very many notes. Are we ready to go? Yes. Uh, yeah, will, thanks for all the information, Rick. I will see you all later and I will stop recording right now. I think I will. <laughs> what? Thanks, Rick. Recording. Where do I? How do I stop? It's recording? on the top left. Oh, recording. Do you want me to stop it? If I stop it, will it also allow me to save the recording? It will. The recording will save automatically when you exit the program, and and you want to keep your computer going because it will take a little while, especially for this length of meeting. So don't turn your computer off, just keep, let it go. And then it will send you an email when it's ready. Oh, so I just said record to the... To the cloud. And that means oh. that the, the recording will be available on the, the, the uh, district account website instead of going to your computer locally, which is where it needs to be so that everybody can access it. Okay, so I just click end meeting for all and we say goodbye. Yep. Thank you every for everybody for being here. And happy hunting. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Bye. Bye.